Natasha, and rather sobering what uh, you had to say. And it's, of course, in all our thoughts. I was going to begin, I shall begin, by quoting what you yourself said, what we're trying to do. And you wrote, please join us in examining the history of the ancient battle as our own world considers the meanings of freedom and slavery, cooperation and neutrality, tyranny and democracy, the terror of annihilation and the striving for victory. And I must say initially that this conference, this webinar is entirely Natasha's uh, idea. And uh, without her, it wouldn't have happened. She contacted me and I was um, thrilled to be approached and to join forces. I had no idea just how magnetic her attraction is insofar as the uh, range of the participants, the number and range and quality are all quite superb. I think we have something like 23 of us signed up. 18 of us are male insofar as we self-identify still in that way, five female. And that has one very important uh, implication, which perhaps I will be able to allay some participants' anxieties. We couldn't therefore make sure that every panel had both a male, at least one, and at least one female speaker. And I take it now, I think it's probably generally accepted practice, that that is the rule, that we believe that that is what should automatically in any conference be the case if it is physically possible. And in this case, uh, it was not. I'm probably out a bit, but I think about a dozen countries are represented amongst us in one way or another among the 23 of us uh, participating. So that's all terrific. You know what the sessions are. You've had the program in advance. There's a topping and tailing. We're in the introductory one and then there will be a conclusion. And between those there are seven sessions. The things of the battle, the words of the battle, a view from Sparta, a view from Thebes, a view from Persia, the fighting, the memories. I asked Natasha whether she thought this was a good idea, and she agreed to ask you all, those of you who are giving papers and participating in the panels, to send in questions that you may, of course, yourselves be going to address explicitly in your own contribution. But of course, they may not. They may be questions that you hope other panelists will be able to answer particularly uh, helpfully or throw light on, even if no certain answer is possible. So I went through those uh, in advance and I divided them up into six categories. Of course, they overlap and they're not exhaustive. And Natasha is very generous. She allocated me something like 40 minutes, 30 to 40 minutes. I honestly don't think I'm going to want to use up all those, but I'll, I'll go along and see where we go. So in other words, the first panel, this is really warning for Chris Tupman, may start a little bit earlier than the advertised time. So first of all, and this is the obvious point, we're historians, or most of us are at any rate, and so historiography, the writing of history. We historians make history after all. The past is one thing. What we make of it is history. And so under that head, historiography, there are very many ways, of course, of uh, asking questions about our sources. And uh, one of you wrote in, are there any alternatives to retelling Herodotus, a kind of desperation there. <laughs> and so I just throw that open to you all. Of course, there are other written narrative sources of the, but one might say that one would wish to privilege the account of Herodotus, but in which case, why? What is it about Herodotus' account that commands um, respect? And uh, I was asked fairly recently, you may know there is a Herodotus helpline that goes on organized by Tom Harrison 
and by Jan Haywood. It's an online ongoing webinar and it has a um, blog attached to it. So I was asked, would you please respond to somebody who asked, how reliable is Herodotus? Well, it's out there. If you want to chase it up, my answer is there. But it's not an easy question. And I'm going to come to one particular aspect of that dilemma, how we uh, react to Herodotus later on, because one of you asked a specific question about Herodotus's claim to know something. On what basis did he claim to know? So that's the most gen generic uh, of all the questions of a historiographical nature. Then this is the negative side, if you like, uh, of Herodotus. Yes, um, we may think he's reliable in some fundamental sense. And otherwise, what, why are we here, you could say. But on the other hand, why does he get some things demonstrably wrong? And one of the things he gets demonstrably wrong within his own narrative version is numbers. So one of you asked, how do you reconcile a number, namely 300,000, with his, this is on the Persian side, with his description of the, the camp. I'll, I'll come on to this again later. And then on the other side, that, that's a numbers issue. There are all sorts of other issues. But one of the others that one of you put to me was plausibility. In other words, not demonstrably false, but gosh, really? You know, seriously questionable. And so one of those would be the double shifting around before the battle actually started, after the 11 days of waiting. Suddenly, Pausanias, commander in chief of the Greek side, decides that he wants this bit to be on that side. And then they cross over, allegedly, and then, oh, they have to cross back. So we're back where we're plausible, propaganda, negative, throwing um, mud at Pausanias, who, whose career after <laughs> Plataea was not entirely of the most admirable in the eyes of many, even good Hellenes. So there's a question of um, plausibility. And then fundamental question of fact, uh, and what were Herodotus's sources for his account of the disposition of the Greek side, for example? How could he be confident that he knew or confident enough to report problematically the alleged distribution and disposition of the Greek forces? Then that's, if you like, from the ancient side, we're thinking in terms of what sort of source, in a way, is Herodotus, and what were his sources? Then one of you asked, is there a way in which we can apply modern military theories, that is, theories of battle enunciated by specialists in writing about military history or the theory of military strategy and tactics? I'm thinking of, for example, Major General Fuller. How far can modern military theories and models aid our understanding of, in particular, Patea, though of course it has a wider application? Now, one article that's very much impressed me, and it has an application to one particular aspect of our whole debate, it was uh, originally delivered in Oxford to the Oxford Philological Society right at the beginning of the 20th century, but was not published until 1964 in the Journal of Hellenic Studies. It's by a guy called Watley, W-H-A-T-L-E-Y, N. Watley. And his issue was, and he, spoke, he focused on marathon, can we ever, given our available source repertoire, seriously, reliably, confidently reconstruct the evolution of how a particular ancient battle went from its originally arraying of the two sides to their engagement to the outcome. And it was called something like the problem of marathon and other ancient battles. And it's a very salutary read for anybody talking about any ancient battle. So that's my first category, historiography. Second category, modern scientific techniques. In particular, archaeology. 
So of course, archaeology has um, progressed um, incredibly since the first spades were sunk in Greek soil in the middle of the 19th century by the new Greek archaeological service. We have all sorts of new scientific means of measuring, of weighing, of dissecting the finds and so on. We now have, of course, thanks to satellite technology, uh, LIDAR, GIS mappings and so on. The question is, how far can these new scientific techniques, both archaeological and, if I can put it this way, aerial, how far can they throw light, new light, on the Battle of Batir? And then within the category of excavation, which um, is extremely expensive, I mean, I don't need to tell you this, but some people think that actually, in a way, it's a waste of money because you can get as much information of a, an important kind through non-invasive techniques of investigating what is subsoil. If you're going to excavate, what people sent to me in the way of questions were they would really like to know whether we will ever be able to find the mass graves, which are referred to in Herodotus, the polyandria. Are they there somewhere, buried beneath the Plataean soil, or have they just disappeared into the, the ground? Or and then this is relating to the point I made before about the disposition of Greek forces. Could archaeology somehow act as a check on or even a corroborator of Herodotus's description of the disposition of the Greek forces? I just throw that out. Paul Christensen and I, you probably know this, are currently engaged in an archaeo historical project on archaic Greece, hence Beck is one of our authors working on themes. So we're currently immensely sensitive to the relationship between the evidence that archaeology provides as opposed to the evidence that literary, written, epigraphic, whatever sources provide. Next category, numbers, which I've already broached, of course, in a way. Well, one of you pointed out precisely that numerical point about the contradiction between 300,000 on the Persian side, the size of the stockade camp, <laughs> they don't work together. So where did Herodotus get his numbers from? And is it simply the case that because the Greeks, this is generic, all Greeks, were not very good at big numbers, their word for countless, um, we say myriads, literally means 10,000. Aristotle, when he is formulating the physical conditions for his ideal polis, what is the upper limit of the citizen body? 10,000. So any more than 10,000 seems to them enormous. Well, 300,000, and of course, carry on up. I've seen estimates of both sides. If you add together the figures in Herodotus and elsewhere on the Persian, on the Greek, you're talking about a hundred thousand on each side. Is that feasible? Is that possible? Is that the sort of figure we should have in mind? Making it, I believe, the biggest single battle between Greeks and, of course, in this case, non-Greeks, but involving Greeks on record. And then one of you asked, and this is a perennial, and of course it relates very specifically to just one bit of Herodotus, and it's the figure of seven to one helots to Spartiates. So you've got 5,000 uh, Spartans, Lacedaemonioi in the sense of Spartiates, you've got 5,000 Lacedaemonioi in the sense of Perioics. They seem to me, I don't know if to everybody, plausible, in a ballpark sense, Herodotus says there were seven helots for every Spartan. Why? Um, a Spartan, for example, at Thermopylae, will have had one helot Batman. He may have had more, I suppose, but I mean, that's a given. And there's the famous bit in uh, Book 7, a Spartan is so blinded, he's got some sort of eye disease, that unaided, he can't even walk into the front of the battle. So he asks his helot 
to lead him and the helot. So there's your Spartan helot. Why seven times uh, the number of Spartan? Anyway, good question. Then fourth category, this is the category of generalship and the leadership of men in battle. And as regards particular individuals. So we start, of course, right at the top on the Greek side. It's very difficult to ask questions about the Persian side, but nevertheless, one of you did ask one particular question, which I'll come back to in the category of strategy and tactics. But anyway, insofar as leadership, generalship is concerned, what was the relationship between Pausanias, Pausanias, and Eurianax, Evrianax? in the Spartan chain of command. Herodotus mentions Eurianax and that's it. You know, when, where's he go? What does he actually do? What was his function? And then one of you asked, where is Aristides in the Battle of Plataea? I mean, famously, Plutarch writes a life of Aristides. Some people, those of you that is, who believe that there is a real original 479 BC basis to the Oath of Plataea, believe that it could have been sworn when the Spartan force coming from the Peloponnese meets the Athenian force led by Aristides, 8,000 of them, at Eleusis, symbolic place to meet. They swear the oath, then they go north into the ocean. Well, where is he in um, Herodotus's account of the Battle of Plataea. And then a number of you, a couple of you, any rate, mentioned the, I think it's notorious, uh, Amomphoratus episode. It smells to me wrong. It, yes, there are known cases of dissent where either lots of Spartans, or in this case, one Spartan, doesn't act as Spartans are supposed to do when they're told to do something by their superior officer, they don't automatically do it. Well, yes, Amamphoratus conceivably therefore could have said, look, Pausanias, I, I honestly don't think this is the best thing to do. Well, you're damn well going to do it, Pausanias replies. End of story. I'm your commander in chief. No, Amamphoratus makes a big Fasaria, as the Greeks would say, I've got this stone here at Insons. Well, to me, no. That sounds to me as anti Pausanias, anti Spartan propaganda. But you may well take a different view, and I'd be very interested to hear a defense of the validity and truth of what Amalfaratus was doing. What was he up to uh, in Plataea? That's then <clears throat> leadership of men, officers. What about strategy and tactics? Well, one point, one, one of you pointed out to me that on the Persian side, one thing that went wrong, I mean, no doubt many things went wrong, was the failure of what perhaps many of us thought was a Persian doctrine, namely of combined arms, combining infantry, light infantry, heavy infantry with cavalry. Well, something seems to have gone very wrong there. Whose fault was it? Why did it happen? And was Plataea, if you like, uniquely a failure, thereby enabling the Greek victory? Where, this is a more specific question on the Persian side, where are the immortals in the Battle of Plataea? They are prominent in the Thermopylae episode, book seven, of course, they um, conduct the round the back up through the Anapaya Pass maneuver, which pincers, kettles Leonidas and his remaining allies in the Thermopylae Pass. They're obviously very, very important at Thermopylae. What's happened at Plataea? Where have they gone? Uh, is there a reason why they're not more prominent? And then one of you is interested not just on the Persian side, but on the Greek side. We know about the, as it were, protagonists. So Mardonius, the well, immortals, if they were there, but venerate his principal forces. We know about on the Greek side, in particular, Sparta, Athens, if you like. 
on the Persian side feeds. <coughs> but we don't hear much of what they actually did, the lesser forces on both sides, apart from those few protagonist principles, either during the battle or what was their attitude after the battle? Of course, we'll never know um, the Persian inferior forces, all the multinational groups, they go back with their tail between their legs, those survivors to uh, the Persian Empire, where they came from. We know what uh, the Greek as it were, political situation was generically, but what about in particular? I suppose one might think about Thessaly as one example. In other words, I'm thinking about the punishments under the rubric, under the aegis of the supposed Hellenic League. If you didn't fight on our side, you are traitors and we're going to punish you. So we know about that. But there were more than just Thessalians and Thebans on the Persian side. Okay. And then final question, which is in a way um, the bigger one. I wrote a whole book about it in a way called After Thermopylae. And this is how Corvisier begins his uh, little book. I don't know if this is going to show up on the screen, but it's called La Bataille de Platé and it's 479, Jean-Nicolas Corvisier. It's one of the very few, if not the only, I think, book devoted, and that in itself says something, to the Battle of Patea, as opposed to the Battle of Marathon, Battle of Thermopylae, many, many books. So, legacy. Even though Herodotus described or characterized the battle as the fairest of those we know, the most beautiful, you could say, nevertheless, it was not handed down in such a way that it established itself in the tradition of reception, in the way that Thermopylae, even though it was a defeat, Marathon, because it was a victory, established themselves. And then a number of you, a couple of you asked how, what was the nature of the ritual commemorations that succeeded the, the battle itself in terms of immediate consecration of the battlefield sites and the various points where there were religious shrines already in existence. And then more uh, long term, of course, for example, Athens would include prayers about uh, the victory in its regular meetings of the assembly and that sort of thing. So how far and in what ways was Plataea actually commemorated, even though in the grand scheme of things, it lost out to Salamis for the Athenians, Marathon for the Athenians, and Thermopylae for the Spartans, among commemorations of great deeds, Megala and Thaumasta, Erga, as Herodotus might have called them. So that concludes, Natasha, my contribution. And as I said, uh, I did think I wouldn't um, exhaust all the time you very kindly allotted to me. So I'll hand over to you uh, to take us forward.